Hello, how y'all doing today? My name is Bernie Thompson and today we're here to take a look at this 1999 Toyota 4Runner. This little 4Runner has a problem. It's setting a code for a knock sensor. Both knock sensors have been replaced. The harness under the intake has been replaced and the computer has been replaced. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get some basic data from a scan tool. So let's go ahead and get a scan tool connected to this vehicle. Okay guys, I got some the scan tool up. I want to get the code, so we're going to go to DTCs. And I got a P0325 knock sensor for bank one has a malfunction. So this is the code they've been chasing. This is why I'm here. I'm looking at this knock sensor bank one code. So now that I see what code, and it's, it, the code is present right now, so what I want to do is I want to put an oscilloscope on this and I want to test the circuit. So let's go ahead and get that oscilloscope on the circuit so we can figure out what's going on with this little forerunner. Okay guys, so I got my oscilloscope connected. Let me show you where my connections go. I got the ground on the battery negative. That's always where your ground goes when you first start your diagnostic procedure. I've got channel 1 yellow on the knock sensor 1. I got channel channel 2 red on the knock sensor for 2 and I've got green on the sensor's ground. There's a third ground or shielding cable that goes into this connector. And I found the connector down under here and I pulled it up. So this is the connector, this is what goes down to the harness and goes to the two knock sensors down underneath there. So now let's just give it a quick test. Okay, the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that the knock sensors are connected under the intake manifold. So I'm going to use my scope to do that. We're going to come over here and I can see I'm connected to my first three leads, so I'm good there. Now I want to just graph this. I'm going to take my hammer. Okay, so I can see I've got a knock on one on sensor 2, but sensor 1 does not have anything. Sensor 1 should be the yellow and there's nothing there. So now the circuit could be being pulled down or it's not connected to the sensors no good. Even though even though these sensors and the harness are new guys, you cannot count on that meaning that they're good. Let's test it. So what I want to do is I want to disconnect it so the circuit can't load these sensors. And let me disconnect it and see what's going to happen. Okay, I got that disconnected. Now the harness just goes to the knock sensors and we're disconnected from the computer. So now let's see what we've got. Okay, guys. Okay, wow. Okay, so I can see now I have something here. So now I have a strike. I can see that both of them are making energy, but one of them doesn't have the same amount of energy. Do you see how sensor one is way smaller? Let's look at this. Look at how much smaller sensor 1 is than sensor 2. Do you see how much bigger it is? Okay, so sensor 1 is way smaller and we have it disconnected. Now, I want to connect this. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plug this in and we're going to do this again with it plugged in. Okay, so now we're going to restart this. We're going to do the test again. Okay, look at that. When I plug it in, we totally lose sensor 1, but sensor 2 is there. Okay, guys, whenever you're doing this testing, you've got to understand what kind of sensor you're dealing with. These are piezo sensors, and a piezo sensor uses quartz crystal or Rochelle salt, and when you get force put on it, it makes voltage output from force. The other thing is, is these sensors have to be torqued correctly into the engine or you can damage them when you put them in. So maybe this is not even that this is an AutoZone sensor compared to an OE sensor, maybe they're not torqued right. But right now, I can see that I'm not putting out as much. Now I can see that when I plug it in, it totally goes away. But these sensors don't make a lot of current. They make voltage by the principle of a piezo effect. 
I put strain on them, I strain it, they have a voltage output. But if they don't put out enough voltage and I'm plugged into the circuit, it could pull it down. So don't get confused right now by thinking that because I unplugged it, this isn't a circuit. They should both be the same size. I'm going to unplug this again. Okay, so I got that unplugged. I say so clearly I can see that I have something coming out but it's not as big in magnitude as the other sensor so this sensor just isn't putting out enough and when I plug it in the circuits gonna load it now always we have a load on these because the circuit is going to use it now it's not very much of a load usually when I've checked these sensors if the loads over 50 K 40 K you're okay, but when it gets so how much resistance is in the in what it's reading it with, and whoever designed the circuit knows that you need some kind of circuit that doesn't load it, but this somehow is loading it now. But it, the problem here is is I do not have it loaded, guys. I want you to understand it is unplugged right now, and we can see that every one of these is smaller than than the other sensor. Now, one thing that I want to make sure of is right now we're hitting the manifold. Now I want to hit both sides. I want to hit in the back. So I've got a bar here and we're going to hit by both sensors. So that I'm hitting, that's I'm hitting it in the back and we can see we still have that problem that the number one sensor or bank one is not producing as big a hit as the second sensor. Now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm going to hit this, so I'm going to put this on a bolt up here by the front. So we hit it in the back and we hit it in the front and I want to make sure that it's not where the knock is coming in that's making that difference. Now we're hitting it in the front and we can see we even have a bigger problem. Sensor 1 is just not producing the same amount of amplitude. Now guys, this is not a problem with the circuit or the pulling it down because I'm not making enough and I'm unplugged. So this has something to do with the sensor or the harness that's connected to these sensors. So now is what we're going to need to do is get this intake manifold off here so we can figure out where the problem is. But for surely sensor one is not producing the same output. And when you plug it in, if you don't have the same output, when you plug it in, it's going to pull the signal down because signals get pulled down when they're plugged in. And when you got sensors like these or oxygen sensors, they just don't make much output in current. They make voltage but not current. So a circuit can pull it down. If it's not producing enough, you'll get a, it'll load it and it can't output enough. So in this case, I don't think this is in the circuit. I think this problem, it's under the intake because when I got it unplugged, I still have a problem. Now, if these were equal when I unplugged it and they're the same size and I plug it back in and then one gets pulled down, that's the circuits loading it. But notice that's not what we have. We have an unplugged right now and we have one that produces a good output and one has a much smaller output. That has some type of a problem with the sensor or the harness that's connected. So let's go ahead and get this intake off so we can figure out what's wrong with this vehicle. Okay guys, they got the manifold off. Let me show you what we got here. We've got the two NOx sensors. They're both new and we got a new harness. We can see the harness and the sensors are new. And then I'm in the harness up here. Now what I've done is if you just unplug this, you cannot test it. Because if you flat unplug it, you're open circuit voltage. Remember, anything that's open circuit always has source voltage there, so we really don't know. So in order to really test these sensors and not be plugging them in and out, I want to load on them. 
Okay, so what I've done so I can load these is I have two resistance boxes and I got 20k on each one. We've got them grounded and then I've got them just teed in to my T's that are in my channel 1 and channel 2. And so this will put a load on that sensor. So now it's got to drive a load. Now when you're testing this type of sensor you really need to put a load on them so you need some type of resistance. If you have them open circuit and you got a problem you may not see it and you might put it back together. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. I don't want you guys to do that. You know anytime you have open circuit it's open you always have source voltage and they might look like they're okay but we need to make sure that they can drive current so what I've got now is now let's let's go ahead and test them with with this on here and let's see how they look Rolling. okay so we want to start the scope and we want to see what kind of signal we make now that we're driving a load Okay, we can see how big sensor 2 is, knock sensor 2, compared to 1. We can clearly see that 2 is big and 1 is not. And that's on every one of those hits. See how big 2 is and how small 1 is? So this isn't able to drive any current, so it's not going to work. So we need to figure out what's going on, but I think this is a sensor here. So let's take a look at these sensors. Okay guys, so I got a sensor from Toyota. Actually it came from World Pack, but it's a genuine Toyota sensor. And I've got it installed. So now let's go ahead and get some data on this. I've still got 20K load on each one. So each one is being loaded 20. Well boy, the yellow one's big now guys. What a difference. Now bank one is bigger than bank two. Look at that. That's so cool, I can't believe it. But now I'm worried about the other aftermarket sensor. That's bank two. That's an AutoZone sensor. That's an OE sensor from Whirlpack. Look at how much bigger the amplitude is. Before, this was reversed. The other sensor couldn't make anything. Now I want to do one thing right now. I want to go ahead, I've got it at 20K, and these sensors usually get drugged down about 20K. That's what I wanted to see. Can it make 20K and four power it? So now I'm going to put 40K in. I'm going to take the 20K out, and I'm going to put 40K in. So now we got 40K in each one. Now let's see, it should drive and they should be about even now, I would think. Okay, so here we are. Let's shut this off. Okay, now we're still, the new sensor still is way, way bigger than the other sensor. So we flipped this problem. We were setting a code for bank one, or sensor one, I'm sorry, knock sensor one. We were setting a code for knock sensor one. Now knock sensor one has a lot of output and knock sensor two has real little output. So now I'm worried about what I'm going to do here. I don't want to put it back together and have them have to put this sensor in here. So what I want to do now is I want to plug it back into the computer and take my boxes off. Just always remember that if you're going to test one of these sensors, you can't just open circuit it. So let's try to do that. Let's open circuit this. Let's go ahead and get all the resistance out of it. So it's just flat open circuit, and let's see what we get now. So now I've got no load on it. There's no resistance, no load. And sensor one is still bigger than sensor two, without any load. We still have pretty good amplitude, but now what I need to do is I need to plug this back into the computer and get a look at what it's going to do. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay, okay so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plug these back in. 
Okay, so now we're plugged back into the computer. Now let's test it. This is under a real load. This is the load we first started to test. Okay, so now we're going to hit it, get a shock in there. Okay, so the both sensors at least have a pretty good hit right now. So that's sensor one, and we can see it's definitely bigger. Let's get our cursors up. So I'm measuring the cursors right there. The difference is 1835. So now let's shut off one. Let's go down and measure. Eleven seventy-five. So we the difference one minus two is very different. So again, we can see the difference here. The new sensor just has way more amplitude. The sensor makes more voltage than the aftermarket sensor. Do you see how that sensor, how much less it's making than the other sensor? So this concerns me, but I still have a much bigger signal here than I had. So before, this was way different when I had that other sensor in there. This has way more amplitude, so both sensors at least have some amplitude. But I am a little worried about this aftermarket sensor right now. I don't know if I want to put it back together with that or not, just because now I see what an OE Toyota sensor does and how much bigger it is. I'm concerned about it. So this is way smaller. Do you see that, guys? So I don't know. If we put it back together, do I start setting a code for sensor 2 now rather than sensor 1? Sensor 1 is way, way bigger now. Before sensor 1, barely it would barely register. Sensor 2 was huge and sensor 1 was just this little wiggle on the sensor. Now sensor 2 is at least present. I can see it. So I can see both sensors, and this might work just the way it is right now, because both sensors are present. But the OE sensor sure is bigger, so I'm a little concerned right now. I need to talk to the shop and see what they want to do. And this came from another shop. The other shop wasn't even going to let us pull the intake, and I told them that the only way we could guarantee this job was if we pulled the intake so we could test the sensors to see what was going on. And this is exactly why I said that. Because if he would have gone and done this, he doesn't have a scope at the other shop, and he's not going to be able to figure this out. The only way you're doing this work, guys, is a scope. The scan tool ain't fixing this car for you, so bottom line is you need a scope to do this type of work. But I need to talk to the shop and see what they want to do now. Okay, okay, guys. The shop asked me a really good question. What's the difference between these two? And you know this computer is not looking at the amplitude, it's looking at the frequency, and at a certain frequency it realizes the engine is knocking. So let's test that. So I've got this running in fast capture. So we're going to do the same test we've done. Okay. Now, this is my signal right here. What I want to show you Do you see how it's going up and down? That's a frequency. Look at how much different is it between sensor 2 now and sensor 1. So now I want to, let's do that one more time in fast capture. Now we can see this frequency moving here. See how wider these are? Just a little wider, and these are a little narrower. Now, I can just look at it with my eye and see there's something different here with that frequency. So, what I'm going to say is no, you can't get away with this aftermarket sensor because these frequencies are definitely different between these two.
Do that one more time. Gonna get this a bit. Because what we're interested in is this raining effect. This raining is the knock. And I can see that the yellow one, the the factory sensor, this is the aftermarket sensor, this is the factory sensor. See the difference between the two? The ring is quite a bit different. That means that the, that the aftermarket sensor is not going to work, guys. You're going to have to get another Toyota sensor, even though it's $200, which they've already put these sensors or harnesses in. But you don't want the car to come back and have to do this job again. So the frequency, that's what they're looking for is a knock. That's how the computer's looking at it. It's not just the amplitude. It's this movement. I'm just playing a game with the amplitude because I've done a lot of these knock sensors and this is the way I've always fixed them. I just knock on the motor and then I look for the signal and I can figure out what's wrong. Just like I'm showing you here. But be careful in just showing the amplitude. And this is loaded. We're plugged back into the computer. So these are both loaded as they're going to be once the car is leaves. It's plugged back in. Okay, guys, it's going to need another sensor. We never need another Toyota factory genuine sensor. You know, I can't tell you how many shops I go to that have these type of problems. And the problem is because they've used some aftermarket sensor compared to having an OE sensor. Sometimes it's just best to bite the bullet and put the best thing in. The OE knows how these circuits are made and they know what they're supposed to have and they know how the program is written to look for it. So I'm a believer in OE stuff, I really am. After all the years I've done this, OE sensors, they're just better. Okay guys, the shop got me another Toyota sensor from Whirlpack. They must have, these must fail a lot because they had two of them in stock. Let me show you the difference because it's really crazy. This is the aftermarket one. This is the OE one. Now having an open hole or a knot, I don't think makes any difference because this has to do with the crystals in there under pressure producing an output or a voltage pushing some current. The sensors are basically the same but they are made different and we can already see the outputs way different. So let me get this in there and then let's see what the signal is going to do. Okay guys, so now I've got both sensors in here. I'm going to put it under fast capture. And we're going to get some signals. Now, look at how closely those frequencies mirror each other now. They're right on. And we go back out. Look at how the red is bigger than the yellow now. That's the other new sensor. So, look at how close they are now. Now, remember, we're not looking at amplitude. is not what the computer is looking at, but it's a good judge for me on a scope to see if they're actually producing the same amount. Now this is open circuit, so I can't judge it right now. But if I look at the frequency down here, if I look at these frequencies, I can see where they're very, very close now where they weren't before. Now is what I want to do is I want to plug it in and I want to have it loaded because you don't want to test these unloaded. But unloaded, we can clearly see, look at how close the red is actually a little bit bigger now and before the red was way smaller because the red one was the aftermarket sensor. Now both of these are OE sensors now. And once again we can clearly see that both sensors have about the same output and the more important thing is the frequencies are more close. Okay, so now I want to load it. So we're going to plug it into the computer and retest it. So let's get that done. 
So now we've got those plugged back in, so this sensor will be loaded. The two sensors are now loaded. They're loaded by the computer. We're plugged in. Okay, so I've got them plugged in. So this is loaded. It's like it's going to run with the computer plugged in. And right away, now we can see that sensor 2 is bigger than sensor 1, but they're still pretty close. You can look at these ones right here, and we can see it's pretty close. So we can watch the yellow right here. We see a little red down here. See how close those are? But more importantly, I need to make sure that this frequency in here is riding the same. Really, really close to being the same. We can see it with our eye. With that frequency, they're almost overlaying each other right now. Okay, so these sensors are going to both be okay now. They're plugged in, they're loaded, and they're both working the way I would expect them to work. So we're going to get the intake back on this, and this car is going to be ready to deliver back to the customer. Okay, guys, I'm right off my test drive. I drove it around. We have no code set. So I cleared the code. I drove it around. When we first got here, I cleared the code. I went and drove it around. I got the code back. It was an active code. Now we have no codes, no check engine light. The car is fixed. Now, what I want you to take away from this diagnostic procedure, if you notice, I do the same diagnostic procedure on every car I do. I get a little bit of data and then I look at a scope and I use a diagnostic test plan. The test drive my next test. It is an event data-driven plan. The data is driving the testing. It isn't that this is a forerunner and I got online and I looked at the knock sensors, the harness deteriorates, so I put a harness on there. You know, too many shops do that and you get lost. When you put a harness on there, you put knock sensors on, it doesn't fix it. You put a computer in and it still isn't fixed. At some point, we're going to have to learn how to diagnose cars. What I'm trying to do is show you how to do it. I'm very successful with what I do. I fix the cars I go work on. I do all the cars the same. I get data, I let that data drive the next test, and that test drives the next test. It is a data-driven plan. And then you fix the car. As we can see, what's wrong with this car was two brand new sensors were bad. Without a scope, how do you find that? How do you know those sensors are even good or bad? How do you know what's wrong? We really need to get some electronic training and we need to use scopes. And if you do this, you too will be very successful in your shop troubleshooting. Start to learn some electronics. Get on YouTube. Look, get on, learn electronics. Get a scope. The scope shows you what's going on in the system. Every time I do a video, I'm doing the exact same procedure. I'm not, I don't go look up the stuff on the internet and try to figure out what it might be. That's the way you put a bunch of parts on that doesn't fix the car. If you want to start to fix cars, get an event-driven diagnostic plan and you too will be successful. Troubleshooting vehicles in your shop.